pleasure to introduce Emily Nichols to you. Emily, I met in 2006 when I was working on Consensus. Uh, Emily then had uh, just started or was recently working at uh, PepsiCo. She graduated from the University of Guelph and then was Haskell in at PepsiCo in Peterborough. And then uh, she left and came to the Masters at Mac and she took uh, 16 degree with me the first time I taught it in 2010 and uh, now works full time at ProCensus with John McGregor over there. And I hope at the end that you will have some questions for her related to what she's talking about, but also questions about data analysis in general, about a career with data analysis, engineering, chemical engineering, um, and all sort of things that she, she does in ProCensus. All will all be great questions for her to talk about at the end. Thanks, Okay, great, thanks, Kevin. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, of course, I don't have the advantage of knowing what percentage of the class this represents, but I know it's a busy time of year for you guys, especially the undergrads uh, coming up on the, the end of your final term. And, um, I am ready to um, Anyway, so while you're here, and I hope that you'll find this talk helpful and useful, feel free to interrupt me and ask me a question. Um, I'm just curious if you can tell the audience a little bit, so um, how many are undergrad chem -en students? So that's the majority. Um, grad students? Yeah. Other faculty? Alright, very good. So as Kevin mentioned, I was in the North Chair a couple of years ago, he was the first, and uh, he made a very smart decision to take this course. On that. Um, today I'm going to be introducing DOE or Design and Experiments. Actually, you know, before I get into that topic, I just wanted to, uh, to just say that uh, today is International Women's Day. And you know, I don't usually go out of my way to be like raw, raw women in engineering, but um, because, you know, I, I just think that the world's supposed to be equal and that's just the way it should be and you shouldn't have to, you know, shout about it. But um, actually, just yesterday, I ran into someone who had some pretty strange um, notions and prejudices about women in engineering. So those opinions are still out there. So for the women in the crowd, I would encourage you to go out into your career expecting equality and respect and all those good things, but just knowing that sometimes you do have to still draw on your assertiveness and let people know that saying something that that's really quite and for the men in the crowd, I, I really don't have a message for you. I think you're the solution. <laughs> you're the, you're the, the new generation. And so really, I think that you've been probably brought up with all of the right um, you know, attitudes in terms of gender equality in the workplace. And uh, you know, it's, uh, if you're the youngest person in uh, the workplace when you start out, and there may be some other older guys who need their attitudes uh, figured out, and you can help with that. But I expect that you guys all have it figured out for yourselves by now. So, um, executing a DOE. So, providing experiments, that's my topic for the day. And um, so, I wanted to explain to you why I think you should care about this topic. So, design of experiments is really important. And the academic reason is that it's better than the cost approach, the change one single variable at a time approach. Um, we've known this for many, many years, but still, uh, when you take, you know, um, science in grade school and high school even, that's what's built into your mind. You, when you run this experiment in the chemistry lab or whatever, it's only change one thing at a time. That's, you know, you have to make sure everything else is constant. And uh, there's a better way, but not many people know about it. So, um, that's the academic reason, and Kevin will be telling you lots more about that next week when we get into the details. Um, the other compelling reasons that I want to talk about, though, um, for one thing, this is one of the things in your degree that's going to be directly applicable to your, your career, whatever type of job you choose to do after you leave this place. Many of them can take advantage of design experiments. And because you will have already done this building project that you're about to embark on, um, you'll already have practice and you'll feel comfortable running the DOE. And uh, that brings me to my next point. This skill is going to set you apart, right? Uh, this is a skill that's in a fourth year elective class, so that means not everyone's going to have it. Uh, not all universities even teach it. Um, I didn't have a course like this in my undergrad. Um, so this is, you know, this is something that can really set you apart. 
the third thing is it's not that hard to learn. So I know you guys have slowed through a lot of tough stuff in these last four years, and uh, DOE is not that hard, so all, all the better to, uh, to take it and master it. And finally, on a personal level, it's a really uh, creative type of exercise, so it's, it can be really satisfying that way if you have um, the urge to bring creativity into your engineering <coughs> practice. Um, so it takes creativity to design the experiment that's going to answer the question that you want to ask, that's feasible to execute, and it takes imagination to think it through ahead of time and imagine all the things you could, could go wrong for all the things that you could do in the future to execute. So that's why I think this topic should be important to you. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about muffins. So um, I took this course, like Helen was saying, a couple of years ago. And uh, in my DOE project, uh, I worked with a partner and we chose to experiment on muffins. So why would we do that? Well, first of all, it's a non trivial topic. Right? In baking, there is chemistry involved. And so, you know, we didn't expect to be able to have a, a full understanding of everything that we have in our ingredients in the oven. Um, ingredients are another thing, so unlike, you know, if you're going to do a chemistry experiment or something like that, you have to go get chemicals in the lab, this is easy, you can do that in your kitchen, you can get the ingredients in the grocery store, uh, you don't have to go to lab space, uh, that makes some execution to flip. There are a lot of Y variables in baking, so we looked at, you know, heights and diameters, and we can use them for color and for spotting on the top and for overall shape. And there are lots of potential disturbances, lots of things that can go wrong, and that adds interesting complexity into your project. So I'll talk a little bit more about disturbances later on. So I just want to kind of lead you through the thought process that we went through as we were designing this experiment so that you might be able to take some of those nuggets and apply them to what you're doing. How many people in the room already kind of know what you're doing for this project? Okay. <laughs> Not too many, all right. Okay, so so some of the things I talked about in the previous slide, like the availability of the, the items you need to do your experiment and how easy it is, you know, whether you have the space and the equipment, I mean, those are things to think about. In my year, some people, um, you know, drove their cars around to see how the gas mileage would change when they did this, when they did that. Um, so that's, you know, you need a car for that, and that, I don't know, there's some different things. But, um, Think about something that you know will take a uh, superhuman effort uh, to accomplish. So, speaking about things you could do in the kitchen, here it was important to choose a good recipe because you're going to have to do this experiment for you know make up a whole bunch of batches of muffins different times, right? Um, so, I know I'm going to talk to you briefly about experimental factors, and I'm going to talk about factorial experimentation and how you factors at two levels, right? And so if you have um, three factors that you want to test, and you want to test each of those three factors at two levels, that's going to be eight experiments, right? This is your experimental cube, so you have high and low for each one. So even if you just test the three things at two levels, that's already eight experiments if you do a full factorial. So that's a lot of repetition, so that's why it's important to pick something that's fairly simple to execute. I chose this recipe for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, it does not involve a mix master, so you don't have to wash all the fingers and bowls in between uh, each batch. And number two, the fat in this recipe is a liquid, not a solid fat. And um, everyone bakes a lot from scratch. You will know that if you're going to measure things by volume, which you typically do in the kitchen, um, solid fats are best measured by displacement rather than trying to mash that solid fat into the measuring cup and make sure that all the air holes are filled up. Right? So, um, I like this recipe because it's got vegetable oil, not crystal, and uh, doesn't need the mix master. So choosing your factors. Again, depending on what you want to experiment on, uh, you need to think about factors that make sense for that type of experiment. What question would you like to ask? What factors would you like to know about? Um, my sister's a food scientist, and so I had a little bit of background in deciding what factors made sense here. So here I'm showing um, bread flour and cake and pastry flour. So the reason that we wanted to experiment on flour type is because we know that bread flour has more protein in it than your standard flour. And you know, 
which has one way to indicate the pastry. So those are kind of two ends of the spectrum. All purpose flour would be somewhere in the middle. So with more protein, um, you, the proteins are what forms the matrix in the dough and keeps the air bubbles in. So we expected that if we use bread flour, we should get a taller one. Uh, and baking powder provides the leavening, so again, we expected that more baking powder would give us a taller muffin. Uh, when we came to vegetable amount, vegetable oil amount, we thought that uh, vegetable oil would probably change the texture somewhat, you know, from being kind of heavy and moist to being light and fluffy. Um, so that was the reason for that factor. Now, mixing time. This is, mixing time is kind of interesting because rather than being leaving, it's a process variable, right? It relates a little bit more to uh, the process engineering paradigm. Mixing time relates back to the protein in the flour because uh, the more work you add to a batter, uh, the more you get cross linking between the proteins. And so an overmixed muffin batter should produce a really tough textured muffin. And on top of that, the extra mixing can be the bubble then, which will make it a little bit flatter. So choose your levels carefully. Um, after you choose your factors, you need to choose what your high and low level is going to be, right? If you choose your levels too close together, you probably won't learn anything because your two the results may be just the uh, same. If you put them too far apart, you also may not learn anything. Um, and in this case, we want them all to be edible. So we were trying to make you know enough variation among the different batches that we see something interesting, but we weren't going to just waste a lot of ingredients. All right. So make it feasible, make it work. Now I've drawn up here the cube that you would use if you were going to do a full factorial in three factors, that's eight experiments. And I showed you in the previous slide that we have four factors in this case. So that means we can do 16 experiments. Now next week when Kevin talks to you about fractional factorials, we're going to talk about half fraction, quarter fraction. These are ways to cut down the number of experiments still get most of the information out. And so we were looking at doing a half fraction factorial in four factors, which is eight batches of muffins. I thought, oh my gosh, that is going to take us so long. Okay, what should we do about that? So like I said, I was working with a partner, and we thought, well, maybe we can make two batches at a time. How is that going to impact the logistics of this project? Well, it means that we need double the amount of equipment. And ideally, you want your equipment to be identical, right? Now tell me, whose kitchen has two sets of all the things I've featured up here? Not too many. Um, my kitchen is a little bit of an oddity because I actually did manage to find new things of everything in my kitchen, um, but I do a lot of things. Now, we also wonder if we're going to use, um, you know, if we're going to do two at a time, are we going to put two muffin pans in the other at a time? Is there room for two muffin pans? I mean, you definitely can fit two pans in the other, but it's kind of tight to the walls, and you should only take one at a time. Um, also, which batch should go in which pan? Is the side you know, it's going to matter if it's the left side versus the right side, or the, the edge versus the middle? If we have two people doing the measuring and mixing, now you may have operator effects, right? One person may be measuring a little bit differently than the other, or mixing harder than the other. So that's another thing to think about. And we started to feel like this was a lot of factors to deal with. So we ditched the vegetable oil factor. In its place, we put operator meat. So Holly and Emily, and we were the two operators, and let's see uh, whether there's a difference between the way she bakes muffins and the way I bake muffins. Again, uh, like I mentioned, the mixing time is like a process variable, which is analogous to things uh, in the chemical engineering paradigm. And the operator thing is too, because in my experience, the differences that you tend to see in the way one operator runs the process versus the other are not trivial. So um, it's kind of an interesting factor to work with. You might think about that if you're working in a group, uh, looking at the way one person does something like all right, now disturbances, I promise to talk about disturbances a little bit. And going into this experiment, I sort of felt like I had all the right background knowledge to figure out how to plan this experiment. You know, I've done quite a bit of baking myself, and my sister's a food scientist, and I asked her some questions. Um, but my partner came up with some things that I really had not even thought of. Um, 
Uh, for one thing, the amount of time that would elapse between mixing and baking was kind of a concern. And so we thought, all right, well, we can minimize that if we're just really well organized in the kitchen. But we were still worried that the first muffin board might be different than the last muffin board. So picture this, we're two people standing at the counter. Okay, we're, we're doing our mixing, and then we each have to make even-sized scoops into the muffin cups. And um, what, you know, what's going to be the difference between the first one and the fifth one? Um, this happens when you make paintings. Anybody make paintings? Right? You know, the first one's always like fluffy and stuff. And then by the time you get to the bottom of the bowl and you're scraping it out and you pour it in your pants like a crepe, there's no bubbles left. Um, so, you know, that's a really, that's a real factor. Um, we didn't have a second identical muffin pan, actually, so we decided to go with foil cups. I have paper cups here, but you can buy, like, foil cups in the grocery store that have a lot more uh, structure to them than this, so you can actually put a batter in them and they stand up and hold it without blocking. And so what we decided to do was, um, did I have this on the slide? Yeah. We, we decided to, um, to put them in the muffin uh, cups, the foil cups, on a cookie sheet like this, so, so that we didn't actually have to have two identical muffin pans. Because I did have two identical cookie sheets. And uh, so we made these parchment papers, uh, enough for the whole experiment, and we like, painstakingly traced all these circles so they were in the exact same place on every paper. Um, and um, all right, so now we've, we've, we're, we're talking about the pour order, right? Is the first one going to be different than the last one? Well, what are we going to do about that? So we decided that should be one of the things that we randomized. Uh, so again, Kevin's going to talk to you more about this next week and get into the detail. But if you can't control a factor, right, there's, there's just no way around it. When you make muffins, there's always going to be the first pour and the last pour. So what can you do about it? Well, you can randomize it. So, um, what we did then is we thought we would randomize against the pour order, but also against the pan looking. Like I said, we were worried about front, back, and the oven, middle, side, what's it going to be? So, every muffin cup had a number on the bottom, and that number corresponding to where it should go on the sheet. So, the first one poured for the first batch went here, in position three, towards the front of the oven. The second one poured went here. In position five, so in front of the oven, and so on, we get the idea. So we're working at the counter, really how we were working too. One of us on each side, filling up the muffin cups on each day. Look at this, this sheet, and I don't even have all the complexity shown here. There's a lot to track up. We're trying to do this mixing and trying to minimize the amount of time between getting it done and getting it in the oven. And, and you know, there's a lot of stuff to think about. So it's really important that you get organized before you start. Because um, all this randomizing to take care of all the disturbances we thought of adds complexity to executing the experiment. It needs to go wrong. So that's why it's good to have things prepared ahead of time and well labeled. So we randomized the pour order and the pan location using this chart. Uh, and we did like flipping a coin to decide whether each bath should go in front or the back of the other. Now, I say make it foolproof. Good luck with this. This is where the imagination comes into play because you really have to try and imagine out your whole experiment ahead of time to think about what could go wrong. So, um, what went wrong for us? Well, um, here's a piece of parchment paper um, that, you, that, I showed, that I held up here. So, realize when these muffins come out of the oven, now you have to take them off the cookie sheet so you can reuse that cookie you got seven more batches to do. So um, we needed to keep track of where they had been in the oven. So again, that's where the labeling comes into play. We recruited a third person to do the measuring of the muffins because we decided this was just going to be so much work for two people in one day to make eight batches of muffins and do all of this measuring and mixing and then, and then um, like measuring the ingredients, mixing, and then you know, running the calipers on the uh, muffin that came out of the oven. So, so anyway, we decided that um, as they were cooling, they started to fall a little bit. So we thought, oh, okay, well, we need to randomize the order in which we measure them as well. And so then that was a third randomized story. So it's a lot of work to keep track of those things, so I just really encourage you to try and be organized um, ahead of time so that things don't go wrong. But you can't make it foolproof. Something always goes wrong. Make a test batch first if you can. I mean, 
depending on your experiment, the idea of a test batch may not quite apply. But um, what I'm saying is that if it does apply to your experiment, try to just do like a run through at some, I don't know, middle, middle level. Maybe you pick like the center point of this cube and you just, you know, just kind of walk through the steps of your experiment. So that you've got an idea of how it's going to work and what's going to go wrong. I thought we should pre-measure our ingredients as much as possible. And again, we wanted everything to be identical. We basically got all of us cups and glasses of gold that were covered. So I think we were measuring like we had oil in the short glasses and we had um, I don't know what we had in the tall glasses. We had the flour mixtures with the different amounts of baking powder in these bowls. And we had um, something else in the bottom. Anyway, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture? Can you see anything wrong with it? We're going to eat batches of them. Yeah, there's only seven bowls, but there are eight. There are eight coffee mugs and eight tumblers and eight short glasses if you count them, right? And the reason this happened was the glasses are all lined up, so we've got tumbler, coffee cups, small glass, but a bowl has so much more diameter that by the time we line them up all the way down the counter, we didn't even realize we were missing the bowl, so we got a huge part way through. Funny muffins at the end, but 
honestly, uh, tasting all these batches was a bit much. <laughs> we were pretty tired of them by then. Um, so have fun with it. Um, that's actually not my final thought for the day, but I do want you to make it fun. I mean, the reason that we chose to work with muffins was a couple reasons. I already did, I already did quite a bit of baking in my own kitchen, so I kind of knew what we were getting into. That recipe was one that I had made a bunch of times before, so I knew what to expect, and I, like I said, we had the benefit of using vegetable oil instead of salt fat. Um, my part of my thesis was actually going to be about muffins. Now, the why variable that I worked on in my thesis is actually confidential, so it was, and it was something that we couldn't measure with kitchen equipment. So, you know, it wasn't directly applicable, but I thought, well, here's a chance for me to get a little bit of a head start and learn something about the differences that we can see in the different muffins. Um, so if you have, you know, if you, if you know, if you're a grad student and you know what your thesis is going to be about, then you can choose an experiment that will inform you about something to do with your thesis. Uh, if you're heading into the workforce after this, maybe, um, if you have an idea of kind of what you want to be doing, or maybe you're going to have a job lined up already, maybe there's something that's sort of kind of related to what you're going to be doing, that might be an idea to talk about. Um, when you get finished all of this, of course, then you have the uh, pleasure of analyzing the data. And um, we had uh, some interesting results. So we found out here that the muffin height would be higher. This is just, like I said, we had multiple libraries. This is just our inclusion for the muffin height. So the muffin height would be higher if we use bread flour, uh, reduce the amount of baking powder, and increase the amount of mixing time. Now this was a real surprise to us because, I mean, we expected that bread flour would give us a higher muffin, and we expected that a bigger, uh, a longer mixing time would give us a higher muffin because of what I said about the cross linking of proteins. But we didn't expect that we were going to get a negative coefficient for baking powder. So we went looking in the literature to see if we could find something to back that up. And we did in fact find a book that explained that there was um, kind of an optimum level for baking powder and if you went past it, you wouldn't necessarily get uh, a total muffin. So that's another thing to think about when you're analyzing the data. Sometimes you don't get the results you expect. If our baking powder amounts had been, you know, here and here, right, we would have had a positive coefficient. And if our baking powder amounts had been, you know, on equal distance here, we would have had a zero coefficient. And if our baking powder amounts had been here, we would have, you know, then we have this negative coefficient. You know? So, um, it's earlier I talked about choosing your levels. Like I said, you want to be close enough together, but not too close. Because if you put them too close, you won't earn anything. And if you put them too far, you won't earn anything. Um, so, in this case, it was a good idea to start with a recipe that I already made and I knew it worked. And then draw on my sister's food science experience to help decide how much further up and down to take the factors. Uh, so, that's about all that I have to say about this particular um, DOE. Now, I do design experiments in my work as well. Um, usually, not, um, let, let's call this traditional DOE for a minute. So something like this. I actually do a lot of work with late variable methods, or you might have heard it called multivariate analysis, which you'll be learning about towards the end of the semester. And you can actually combine that topic, uh, latent variable methods, together with DOE to get something that's even more powerful. So if you have, um, let's say we're talking about buckets again, and you have a data set where over a period of several years, a whole bunch of different muffin formulas have been made up in the matrix has 60 ingredients in it, then how are you going to do a DOE in 60 factors, right? That's just what you look at it. And so um, one of the things that I do in my work is we you know these like variable models which compress those many dimensions down into just a few key dimensions, and then you can run DOEs in those first few um, latent variables, which are kind of uh, they're just really linear combinations of the original. So it, it's it's kind of abstract for, for where you're at today. You haven't been quite introduced to the topic of DOE and you haven't seen latent variable methods yet, but I just thought I'd let you know that you know this topic sort of keeps going and if you put this topic together with latent variable methods, which 
the one at the end of the semester. Um, you can accomplish some of your things in a short amount of time. Um, so I, that's, that's about all I have to say about that, but I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions, and if you have some. Oh, I also wanted to give a shout out on the recording to my sister because she's taking this course remotely, so she'll be listening to me in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was just curious if the operator had a different sign of It didn't in our data, no. Um, we took a lot of care. E even though we had made it a factor in our experiment, we were still trying to minimize the differences between the operators because we wanted to see how the other, you know, we just kind of wanted it to be. So when we were stirring, like if we had been using two mix masters side by side, right? We could have like turned them on to level two for 30 seconds and that's it. We had two people standing beside each other, so we were like, we would count it loud, like mix, 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 and scrape the ball down. <laughs> mix. <laughs> Something like that, you know? Um, so no, we get to see the difference. Anything else? If you don't ask me questions, I'm gonna start asking you questions. <laughs> so, anybody out there know what your experiment's going to be? Can you tell me what you thought of, or is that, you know, are you keeping your intellectual properties yourself? Or? Anybody? How many variables did you and Holly end up using? Because I remember your log sheet was so big. Like you, you guys could track every single thing. Yeah, we did. We track everything. So, um, we had our, our experimental factors, and then we had core order and gain location that we were keeping track of, and measuring order, and then our y variables, we had height, and we had short diameter, long diameter, so we tried to like, look at them up and decide, okay, because, you know, diameter, we want to measure, but they're not always perfect. Right? We had a long diameter, short diameter, and we did a rating for spotting and a rating for cracking and I think a rating for overall appearance. So we had, you know, when it came to write up the report, we didn't actually lose, I don't think we used all of that data, but we had lots to work with. Um, that's another, that's actually a good, um, a good point that you, that you asked that because there were multiple Y variables here and um, if you choose an experiment that has multiple Y variables, then when it gets down to the year analysis, if it turns out that you've chosen your factors to go that are too far apart for one of those Y variables, you still have a good shot at you know, having learned something about the other Y variables, right? So if you can add more Y variables to your experiment without adding too much work, that's probably what you describe. Do you have any advice about like, uh, determining how do you know how much like baking powder to use to actually get this shape? Like, did you research it, or did you just do you know what you're trying to ask? We just yeah, we just tried to um, like we didn't this this shape is really just um, conceptual, right? We only did oh. two levels. Oh, okay. Um, but we again just draw drew on the experience that I had with baking. Oh, okay. My sister's been super good science experience to decide how much less. Can the add still get edible? How much more can the add still just edible? I think you decide to keep the time on the signal and that might affect your Well, it's true. Um, and it wasn't a perfect this it wasn't a perfect experiment. But the thing is that um, well for one thing, we weren't measuring the sizes of the muffins by weight. And really that's what you want to do because because of the factors we chose, some of the batters were really fluffy and had lots of air in them, and some were not. And we were using I think it was a third of a cup measuring scoop to fill up the muffin cups. So they all had a third of a cup of batter, but some of them had a lot more mass than others. And so, you know, if you took them all out at the same amount of time, some of them wouldn't even be baked. Uh, so that's, yeah, ideally you want them to be the same weight. Yeah. So you taste test, but so how do you like rank the taste? Like do you do different you say general the taste different value rate different aspects of trying? Um we try to do ratings like to numbers. Um to be quite honest with you, this took all day. We started first thing in the morning, we did all the day changes and we did all
all the measuring out of the Cayman of the Onus. So the tasting was the last thing that we did, and we were pretty tired by that time. We didn't care as much about whether we got the ratings accurate. We, we had lots of data, right? We had height and diameters and we had other things. So but honestly, I remember just feeling like, but so tired by the time we got down, I was like, I don't know if this is different than the one I tasted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you get sick of the muffins by the end of that few weeks? Yeah, I was pretty sick of them. And I don't like the least of them, so I put them in the freezer and, you know, we ate them over a period of several weeks or months, I don't know. <laughs> I had to got pretty tired of muffins too. Every student who's done a baking project is in the conclusion that they just ate that free. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, I'm going to keep on trying. Yeah. 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 Lots of different things. So uh, maybe the, the simplest thing to explain is, is uh, kind of process monitoring or process troubleshooting type of thing where uh, a company has a whole lot of data from the process and they don't really know what's going on with it. They have quality that goes up and down. They're trying to find out what the root cause is. And so, you know, we build models and Using those type of models makes it really easy to kind of drill down to what the root cause is. It's usually not one thing. Um, you know, a lot of companies are employing uh, like Six Sigma type tools to solve problems, and some of those tools are, you know, you list out possible causes and then you try to knock them off one by one. Well, that's a univariate way of thinking about the problem. And usually, uh, not usually, but many times, the, the problem is. Um, well, I think I really benefited from working in between, but I, I don't want that to sound like I'm negative against taking your master's right away. The thing is that when I finished my undergrad, I was really done with school. Um, so it's not like I even considered doing it right away. In fact, I never thought I would come back to school. Uh, I really only came back because late variable methods was really interesting and it was something I wanted to learn. Taking a master's was the way to get that skill done. So it was very specific in my case. I actually, Dr. McGregor came and spoke at the clinic where I was working, and that's what got me interested in. Did you watch the case and you looked at the infrared imaging of brains? So 
there's no uh, sort of feedback loop there, no process. A few times a shift, an operator goes out and he actually has the number of uh, oats in the groats. See what I mean, Dr. Seuss? Oats in the groats. So um, what I did was I took a bunch of samples of oats and groats from different places in the process. And um, I took NIR images of them, the NIR red oats. And then I used multivariate analysis to look at those images. Uh, so the original images, the near infrared ones, had um, 110 channels. So if you imagine, well, again, it's a three-dimensional structure. So think about like this front face is a picture, right? And then you have 110 dimensions behind it. Um, that's what it was like. Every pixel has 110 values at different rates, and then you're in the red. And so um, that generates a really large data set, obviously, that's uh, difficult to, to do it. Except if you use linked variable methods, you can take those 110 dimensions and compress them down uh, to just a few critical dimensions. And then, um, actually, by Refolding, so you have to unfold that three-dimensional matrix to make a model of it, and then if you refold it back up, you can see the predictions for each pixel. Whether the model predicts each pixel that it's an oak or a row, and they pop out like oh, I wish I had a picture in my slides to show you. I mean, you can just you can see the oaks in the row so clearly in this image that it has been processed through a late variable model. But the human eye, I mean, I actually had um, a pile of them on my counter at home. So when I did my thesis, I involved uh, as many extra people as I could because there's a lot of work. So um, the, these samples of oats and gross that I imaged, I needed some pure samples um, to build the model. So I needed to make sure I had no oats and gross and no gross in the oats. And so we actually went in and um, And uh, we did a bunch of that at my house. Anyway, I had a little pile on the counter left over from something, and a friend came over, and she works in the automation industry. And uh, she looked at the pile and she said, what is that? And I said, oh, well, it's just some oats and oats left over. And I said, well, you know, we're working on the way to separate them. And she picked them up and she said, well, I don't know, they all look the same to me. And I said, no, no, see, this is an oat, this is a oat. And she said, someone sent me this, sent, sent me this at work? I'd say, no, quote. I'm not even going to bother to quote that from it. I can't design machine that um, But, you know, with like variable methods, it's something that, that actually works. I've heard about a lot of uh, cases where people use image data. Are there other uh, forms of data that you work with? Um, well, I've done a lot with uh, process data, and I've done a lot with um, like batch data is also three dimensional. So if you have a batch process, you have um, you know a row for each batch and a column for each variable, but then you have an axis back here, so that is three dimensional data. Um, I've also done quite a bit of work with uh, data. So like I mentioned earlier, um, my thesis was on muffins. We did have a matrix of, um, yeah, we had about 60 ingredients and about 26 different muffin formulations to start with before we started doing the yoga. So um, it was a pretty, you know, pretty small matrix in terms of late variable models, but it was pretty large in terms of product development. So if you didn't know about the variables, that would be pretty much an intractable problem. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Come on, I'm really curious about what you guys are doing for your project. Anyone want to offer up what your ideas are? No, all right. Do you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I actually wanted to ask. Would you consider an MBS physical portrait to be your specialization, or are there processes that you specialize in, and this is a skill that would kind of bring them back? Well, for me, I do consulting for many different companies. Um, at Pro Census, that's what we do. So for me, this is the specialization, and then I learn a little bit about each process as I need to. Um, that excites me, I can see. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about the types of companies that you work with? Just in general terms of the areas and so Yeah, yeah. We work with mostly Fortune 500 companies. Um, we, we are constantly doing education because, you know, the late variable method is not a very well-known subject matter. And plenty of companies are happy doing 
things kind of the way they've always done. Um, so we work with lots of large size companies um, in oil and gas, in chemicals, specialty chemicals, pharma. Do you think there's a reason why it's only Fortune 500 countries and not smaller ones? Um, I guess, well, it's, that's partly because we, we kind of market to those companies. Um, definitely we have some smaller companies who benefited a lot, but I guess we tend to talk more about the Fortune 500 ones. Um, but just recently we've had a few smaller, sort of up and coming, um, research type companies contact us because they have a lot of, you know, bench top work, lots of data, and someone has suggested to them, oh, you know, we might want to contact their census because they can help you get some value out of this.